Hey guys, so today we're going to go over the absorbance question from the AP Chem 2020 FRQ. Um, note that the specific questions that were answered varied actually, depending on the form, to stop cheating, or at least to uh, minimize cheating. So we may not be seeing the exact same questions, but hopefully this kind of thing will be giving you a good intuition on how to solve problems. Um, but before we do that, and before we start, I want to kind of go over what absorbance really is, because a lot of people really um, didn't really understand it well. Um, so what an absorbance experiment is, is you have, you have a solution of some unknown thing, and you shine some light on it. And these light rays have some sort of intense, incoming intensity which you know because the machine produces it. That's called I0. However, some of the light will scatter off and that comes back with intensity I. So what the machine does is it knows how much or how many photons it emits. So it knows its intensity that it's emitting and then it measures the intensity that comes back. And basically absorbance is related to the ratio between these. And it's related this way such that um, the higher the concentration, the higher the absorbance. So the lesser this quantity is, the greater the absorbance is. Um, the actual formula is in the form of logarithm. So now that we have that out of the way, um, unfortunately, that's something that's not really taught a lot in AP Chem classrooms, which I think is a crime, but you know, it's whatever. So we're going to be going through this now. So the first one says, write the KEQ expression for the equilibrium reaction above. So what the KEQ expression is, uh, equilibrium constant expression, is reactants or products of reactants. So that also excludes any liquids or solids. So we don't write the water term in the equilibrium expression. So we just write the uh, aqueous species. I want to write the denominator first just because it's larger. BP. Sorry for the sloppy handwriting. I'm writing with a mouse. So first, the concentration of BPB times concentration of hydronium, because those are both reactants. And then on top, that is HBPB+. Note that you have to write the charge inside the brackets, because um, the charge is part of the chemical species. So. Yeah, that's part A. And part B says, which peak, or rather gives you an absorbance spectrum of that shows both the wavelengths at HP, HBPB plus and BBP. It says, which peak, the one at 440 nanometers or the one at 590 nanometers results in the absorption of photons at the greater energy? So what we do know is that the energy of light is Planck's constant times the frequency. We also know that the speed of light is the frequency or the wavelength times the frequency. So when you solve for the frequency in this case, you get the frequency is the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So when you plug this back into here, you get the energy, the energy is equal to HC over lambda. So what we see is lesser wavelength means greater energy. So the 440 nanometer one results from the absorption of photons at the greater energy. So based on the diagram above, is the forward reaction endothermic or exothermic? Justify your answer in terms of Le Chatelier's principle. So we only have to look at one of these peaks um, to understand what's happening chemically. So we're going to pick the one that has the reactant on it. Uh, you can pick either one and it would still work out just fine. So we're going to pick the BBP peak right here. So what happens when you increase the temperature? So when you increase the temperature, you also increase the concentration of the products. Um, absorbance is directly proportional to concentration. That's on the formula sheet. You have A is equal to ABC. Either the A or the B is the path length. I'm not sure. And then the other one is the molar absorptivity which is only chemically species dependent, much like molar mass. And then you have the C term right here, which is the concentration. So greater the concentration, greater the absorbance. Um, 
So when you increase the temperature, you also increase the concentration of the products because you see the absorption peak go up whenever the temperature increases. So that means um, you can add heat on this side. So when you increase temperature, the reaction shifts to the left, increasing the concentration of BVP. So exothermic because increasing temp shifts reaction towards the products. Next question. So this is based on the best fit line. What is the approximate absorbance for a solution in which the concentration of BPB is 2.0 times 10 to the negative fifth molar? So this is just um, looking at the best fit line and extrapolating from data. So you see BPP is 2 times 10 to the negative 5. We can line that up with um, somewhere in the absorbance line or the absorbance axis. And we see the absorbance is approximately 0 0.3. Seven. So one important thing to notice here is absorbance is unitless. And there's two reasons for that. One, absorbance is a function of the ratio between two intensities, and the ratio between any two quantities is going to be unitless. Secondly, it's also a logarithm of that ratio, which you're not expected to know. Um, but a logarithm of any quantity is going to be unitless. So this is where the alternatives start coming in, right? Um, so the alternative here is just if it's at 3.5 times the negative fifth, which is right here, and then we can extrapolate that data. Um, I'm not worried about my lines being super straight um, because it really doesn't matter. And we see that the absorbance for that case is approximately around 0 0.66. Um, but again, anywhere, as long as you're in the ballpark, it's not going to matter just because you're extrapolating from a line without a ruler. <coughs> Apologies, I'm kind of sick. Part E. It says a student measures the absorbance of a solution of BPP of unknown concentration to determine the concentration of BPP in a solution using calibration plot above. If H2O remains in the cuvette prior to being filled with the solution, how will the estimated molarity compare to the actual BPP in the solution? There's an alternative, and it says there's fingerprints in the cuvette instead of water. So if you pour, if you pour the solution of BPP into more water. this concentration decreases, which means um, you'll be measuring a lower concentration than the actual original solution because you're diluting it. So that means that the concentration of BPB, the actual concentration, is greater than, greater than the measured. What happens if there's fingerprints in the cuvette, though? So we talked about absorbance, and what absorbance is, it's a measure of um, the intensity of the light that scatters off the chemical species. Um, and if there's fingerprints on the curve, then the fingerprints are also going to absorb some light. So what happens is there's a greater absorbance when there's fingerprints on the cuvette. Um, because there's a greater absorbance, there's a greater measured um, concentration. So this is for the water part. I'll label that water. Maybe if I could actually write that correctly. And I'm going to write fingerprints. So the actual concentration would be less than the measured concentration. Um, and again, you explain that all with what absorbance actually is um, for the second for, for the fingerprints one. And for water, you just simply dilute the solution when there's water still in there. Part F says determine the reaction's half-life, include units. So we know the absorbance is directly proportional to concentration. So when the absorbance uh, decreases by a factor of two, so the concentration. And the half-life for a reaction is the amount of time it takes for a concentration to half. So we see that that happens from zero to one hour, one hour to two hour, two hour to three hours. So the half-life is one hour. 1.00 hours. Explain how the absorbance and time data are consistent with a process that is first order with respect to BPB. Um, basically, what we see here is we see that the half-life does not change with concentration, which is exactly what a first order reaction is, or a characteristic of a first order reaction. Um, both zeroth order 
in second order both have concentration dependent half lives so t one half is constant so reaction is first order with respect to b p b p p b a second trial is conducted at the same temperature but with the concentration of hydroxide changed to 0.4 molar the observed half of the reaction is shorter than for the first trial when oh was 0.1 molar Explain in terms of particle collisions why the half-life of the reaction decreases when the concentration of hydroxide has changed from 0.1 molar to 0.4 molar. So increasing the amount of mole or increasing the molarity of the hydroxide is also going to increase the number of particles of hydroxide if the volume stays the same. So what that means is that um, there's more particles, so there's a higher collision frequency. So collision frequency increases. But because the collision frequency increases, that means there's more reactive collisions, meaning a collision at the right orientation forms a new chemical species. So that also increases the reaction rate. And if the reaction is happening faster, then the uh, reactants take less time to uh, decrease, to be cut in half. So that means half-life decreases. It says when OH is changed to 0.1 molar, from 0.1 molar to 0.4 molar, as the magnitude of delta H reaction increase decreases to the same, and the alternative was what happens to the activation energy. So delta H reaction, the enthalpy of a reaction, uh, degrees to mean standard state. Um, this stays the same. And I'm not going to write out the full explanation because that's a lot of words, and I'm writing with a mouse. And as you can see, I'm struggling <laughs> writing right now. <coughs> but the reason why is because this is reaction specific. All that matters is the chemical profiles of the chemical species inside whatever container they're reacting in. Um, the concentration does not matter. And the, one of the hints there is the units for delta H reaction is energy per mole. So it changes with molarity. Um, so because it's a per mole quantity, it doesn't really matter how many moles there are in the first place. This is what happens to the activation energy for the alternative also stays the same. So I'm gonna put, I don't wanna write this again, blue quotes. So I'll do, make this a little obvious. So the reason why that is, is because the only thing that matters the activation energy is the reaction pathway or the kinetic mechanism of the reaction and increase or changing the concentration isn't gonna change how the reaction actually chemically proceeds. It's just gonna change how fast it proceeds. The activation energy does not matter or does not change when you change the concentration. Uh, next part says, in order to measure or in order to prepare the 0.1 molar solution of NaOH, a student follows this procedure. Measure up 40 grams of NaOH, add the NaOH to a 1,000 milliliter volumetric flask that is half filled with distilled water. And step three says, add enough distilled water to bring the volume up to the line to the flask or on the flask. Part J says, the chemical quantities here do not produce 0.1 molar NaOH. Describe specifically how they can be changed to produce 0.1 molar NaOH. So let's actually calculate what the molarity of the solution would be. So they give you a nice number. The um, molar mass of an AOH is about 40. So the amount of moles is about 1, and 1,000 milliliters is 1 liter. So that's 1 molar. And we want something that's 0.1 molar. Um, so what we can do is we can cut the mass by a factor of 10 to move the decimal to the right ones, or to the left ones. So use mass of 4 grams, not 40. Um, and the whole process, the same process could be applied to the 16 grams one. I don't want to go through that math um, just because it's the exact same, um, but you can do it. It says another student is preparing a 0.1 molar NaOH solution with correct quantities, but some solid remains at the bottom of the flask. Describe an action to ensure the remaining solid dissolves. So I'm sure a lot of people have thought this. Um, quite literally just stir it. <laughs> um, stirring. Until dissolved. If you want to get more technical with it, what the stirring actually does is it releases um, the salt from adhesion to the side of the flask and exposes the salt uh, in terms of surface area to the solvent more, um, which allows for solvation to be more kinetically favorable. Um, but really, all you have to write is just stirring until dissolved, I'm, I'm assuming. 
Part L says the student notices that the temperature increases when dissolving NaOH and H2O. In a separate experiment, the student dissolves one mole of NaOH in 1,000 grams in each of the solvents X and Y. Assuming enthalpy change is greater or the same regardless of the solvent, will the temperature change of solvent X be greater than, less than, or equal to the temperature change of solvent Y? Justify. So what we do know is that we know that the magnitude of delta H is equal to the heat release, which is Q, per mole, which is N. And Q is MC delta T. And that's per mole, per mole of reaction. So what happens here, right? We have one mole of NaOH, so the amount of moles is constant. We have the same mass of solvent, uh, so that's the same. Delta H can be assumed to be constant, so the magnitude of delta H is constant. So what we have is we have C delta T is constant. So that means the lesser the heat capacity, the greater the change in temperature. So the temperature change of solvent X would be greater than greater than uh, because it has lesser heat capacity because cx is less than cy 